stage for my big Broadway debut, but some two folks all in the back of the Friends Hall I have to speak in the middle here, which is fine. Um, okay. Am I better with or without the mic? With, with the mic? Yeah. Right. All right. Some of you may know that um, Friday and yesterday, Jack, Rumba, and Charlie Johnson and I were at a retreat on the Boca with uh, Bishop Ron Wright from Atlanta. And it was a retreat about leadership in the church. And what, what does a leader put at the center? Purpose, challenges, and shared responsibility. So I had already prepared, I already had these notes, but I thought that that was so appropriate that that is what we need to put at the center here, is purpose and challenge and shared responsibility. And his, also his definition for leadership was the capacity to mobilize people to do difficult tasks. So, that's where you all come in. The leader mobilizes and you are mobilized. So this summer in Vestry, uh, some Vestry members have asked me to speak a little bit about, well, originally it had been my goals for ministry. But in the spirit of that shared responsibility, I want to talk a little bit about what I hope for St. Thomas as all of our shared goals. And after I did that, uh, some folks said that would be a great thing to talk about during stewardship time, to talk about what it is that we see for St. Thomas going forward. I've heard a fair amount, usually um, uh, kind of uh, gracefully said about how nice it would be if we could go back to the way things were before. How nice it would be if we could go back to the way things were before March of 2020 or before um, 2017 or before 2010 or what, pick your date. But the fact is that the world is not what it used to be. And that, that's a good thing as well as a bad thing. We are not the people that we were. And of course the reality is that there's some question about whether we ever were the people we thought we were, whether St. Thomas ever was the place that we remembered it as being. So I think the more important question is, who are we called to be right here and right now? Who are we called to be on the corner of Red Road and North Kendall in 2022, 2023? What's the point? What is our purpose? Why are we here? How are we different from any of the other churches? How are we different from St. Philip's? How are we different from St. Faith's down the other direction? How are we different from Vu up on, Sun on, on Sunset Drive that I keep hearing how their parking lot is full every Sunday? On the other hand, how are we different from the Riviera Club or the Ocean Reef Club? How are we different from St. Thomas in 1953? Or St. Thomas in 1983? Or St. Thomas in 2019? Well, there are a lot, of, a lot of ways we're different and a lot of opportunities we have to go forward. A lot of things that have changed that make things difficult, but a lot of things that have changed to open things up and allow us to do things. And I, I, I wanted to, to talk about several categories of what we do and, and what I hope for. The first one, because it's Sunday morning and because we just had that spectacular uh, worship service in there is to talk about worship. We do beautiful worship. I'm biased, but I think our worship is beautiful. And we have maintained a robust tradition of worship and music here. That's changing. That's not changing that it's not going to be wonderful anymore, but, but the model that we have used is changing. I don't want us to think in terms of how can we figure out to do the same thing just as well in a new context because that can only go on so long. I want us to figure out what does this new context make possible? Why does it make possible that we, that we have uh, maybe a smaller choir? Maybe we have um, a different number of services. Maybe, we can, maybe it's a different model of how we do worship and music that we couldn't have done 10 years ago, but that now is exactly the right thing to do. I don't necessarily have answer to that, but I think that's the kind of question we need to be asking. Um, a lot of folks have asked me, when are we ready to go back to more than one Sunday service? And I am, I am very enthusiastic about that. I, am, I'm, I really hope to reestablish some of the, uh, the, the alternative worship gatherings. Um, I'm a big fan of the early 
night, which I guess here used to be at 8 o'clock. Um, I think it would be great to have a, uh, an afternoon or evening informal worship. It doesn't have to be uh, exactly like the, um, uh, the 40 days worship was a few years ago. I think it would be very cool to have sort of a rotating experimental worship that, uh, you know, for one Sunday a month is, uh, is folk music, one Sunday a month is um, Taze music, one Sunday a month is jazz. One Sunday a month might be a, a sort of a, a dialogical sermon where we sit in a circle and discuss, uh, you know, I, I think that, that, that afternoon or evening service is a great time to experiment. And what I told the vestry this summer, which I thought was going to buy me some time, I said, I don't really want to start looking at that until we have consistently more than 100 people on an average Sunday at 15. So we don't want to divide up the congregation until we're healthy. Well, y'all called my bluff. We have been at or above 100 the last several weeks. Um, <laughs> So I am, I am thinking that this is going to happen sooner than I thought. Maybe I'm, I'm kind of thinking, don't, don't quote me. I'm thinking maybe after the first of the year we can start talking about some of these other worship services. But I think we can't forget our online worship. Um, when I, I'll, I'll tell you that in the vestry meeting, when I said 100 or more on average Sunday, Mary Lou Shad immediately said, well, if you count the online people, you've got over 100 every Sunday. And she's absolutely right. Our online service maybe started off as fixing a problem, uh, doing something that we had to do, and it's become an important part of who we are. We have lots of folks who have become part of our community through our online worship. And we need to make sure that it doesn't become a an afterthought, that it is as important as the 8 a.m. quiet service or the afternoon experimental service or the 1015 service or the Wednesday morning service, that that our online service is robust and, and rich uh, and that, that people can truly connect. I also want to put in a plug for church people to participate in our school worship. You remember what the bishop said last time he was here. That you complain you don't have children in church when you've got 400 of them every Wednesday. Our largest worship service at St. Thomas is Wednesday mornings at 8.15, where we have 500 people in the chapel every Wednesday. Um, it may, it looks a little different, it sounds a little different, but for those of you who have been here on a Wednesday morning, it is a riot and it is fun and it fills your heart. Next category I want to talk about is what I'm calling equipping the saints for ministry, which is not just Christian education, but includes that uh, for adults. Um, I think we have great adult education. Um, Ann and John are here, are they so I can talk about them? Um, I think I think Ann does great stuff, offers great things for us. So much for me, so so much. I think Ginger Center in Prayer, I know I'm such a she is. Uh, her center in prayer, prayer class has, has added so much to our spiritual life. But I think we need to ask what else people need and want. We do a good job of feeding the introverts and the intellectuals. I, uh, I think maybe we need to, uh, to broaden that a little bit. And I would love to think toward, work toward um, fellowship groups, discipleship groups, small learning groups that share and commit to one another. Uh, Mike McGuire is working on reestablishing a men's fellowship group. Uh, I saw a photograph a couple of weeks ago at the St. Jones Guild of a meeting of the men's fellowship in 1970 something. And there were 300 men meeting for lunch. Um, I think it would be very cool to establish some sort of a men's prayer breakfast. Um, we've talked about the fact that men interact differently than women. You may have noticed that. Um, that the women talk about things that men don't, and, and people talked about having been part of prayer groups, small prayer groups with, with men that, that have been very, very moving, and I would love to get that reestablished. There are models like EFM, Education for Ministry, uh, DLCC, Disciples of Christ in Community, Curcio, Walk to Emmaus, they're all sorts, and they're all subtly different from one another, and I know that some of them we've had here in the 
past, I think they can be a great way of deepening our relationships with one another and deepening our faith. Um, I think we do a good job with hospitality and incorporation. Um, I think we can always work harder on that. Um, we had a group of uh, Colin, Mary Lou, Elena, and Lovell, who a couple weeks ago went down to um, Church of the Ascension for uh, an all-day retreat called Invite, Welcome, Connect. And I know they're going to be bringing back ideas to us of, of ways that we can be better at being intentional about following that belief. And to my mind, part of equipping the saints is pastoral care for one another. Um, Charlie um, uh, did a presentation a little while back on Community of Hope. Um, I, I, I hope that he, I think he's planning to continue that. That is, a, again, an intentional program of learning to care for one another, learning to look out for one another. In my mind, pastoral care is about unleashing what we already have with us. We already do a good job of looking after one another. All we need to do is put a name on it. All we need to do is, is, is give it a name and keep doing it because we, we love one another, and that really shows. I think this morning was certainly uh, an indication of it. We need to be very intentional about forming our children and our youth. Um, <laughs> We were, we were up to our knees in children and youth this morning, and it was fantastic. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we offering children and families that is better than soccer, that's better than tennis, that's better than STEM camp? Those things are all worthwhile, uh, and I, I don't want to bad mouth them. But we need to offer something better, or at least something that's a clear choice. Um, years ago, I was, I was working as an architect and we were, we were doing planning for a church congregation. Um, actually, it was a, a, a non-denominational, one of those churches. Um, and the adults in the church had decided that what they really needed to engage the youth was a gym where the kids could play basketball. And they decided that, of course, without talking to the kids. So when we went and talked to the, this very wise leader of the youth group, I think it was 15 years old, he said, you know, there are lots of places in town where we can play basketball. We just want some place we can get together and pray. And I, I think that we need to be aware of asking kids what their spirituality is, asking kids what's important to them, and not assuming we know. I think we need to be flexible about the idea that Sunday morning is probably not the best time for families and kids. Um, and maybe 5690 North Kendall is not the best place for children's programs. We need to be willing to do children's programs that kids and families want, not the ones that we want to do. And with all respect to Claudia and Bree, bringing up our young people is not something that we can hire out. It's not something that we can pay someone else to do. Claudia does a wonderful job, and Claudia is going to be more involved in Christian education with us. But we need all of us to be involved in this. Parents need to be involved in leadership. None of parents need to participate. If this is something we want to happen, we need to do it. Remember that thing about mobilizing people to do difficult tasks? Here we go. I know there's been a lot of hope and talk and waiting for a chaplain associate priest, not least by me, I would love for that person to get here, but we can't wait for him or her. Um, we're in a place in a time right now where that person is, is not knocking on our door. So we've got to get on. And that brings me to the school. Um, our biggest outreach, our biggest ministry, we touch more lives through the school than anything else. But if we focus on getting school families into church, we miss the point. Our school families are in the parish. Our school families are part of our community. It's no different than when there were 8 o'clock people and 10 o'clock people and, and Sunday evening people. They're all part of the same church. And one of the wonderful things about our school community is that we incorporate Catholics, Jews, Greek Orthodox, spiritual but not religious. We incorporate people, Jews, and people from all different backgrounds. And we can be a home for all of these families no matter where they go on Sunday morning or Friday night. I know one 
almost the same time as it's become a cliche, but it is absolutely true, and I think it's actually starting to happen. I think we do a great job with outreach. I think our, our outreach committee does a great job with Chapman, with the St. Andrew Food Pantry, with Women's and Girls Initiative, with Feed My Sheep, and all the other things that they do. I would just bring up some other opportunities that have sort of been tickling my mind. Um, our old partner at Holy Comforter is changing. They're becoming something different than they were. Uh, at, at our meeting yesterday, we just approved some money to pay for the demolition of the Holy Comforter Church building. But the community is still there. The community is still there, and so I, it sounds like they need us as much or more than ever. Um, just up the street in Coconut Grove, Christ Church is a, is a historically um, uh, Afro-Caribbean church that we have almost no relationship with, and they're just, just around the corner. I would love to develop a relationship there. And uh, Wendy and Lilia have heard me talking about uh, a, a group called Love Must, Love Must Act, which uh, creates partnerships between Episcopal parishes and schools in Africa. How cool would that be if our school and Holy Cross School in Grahamstown, South Africa, could be sister schools and we could do things back and forth and we could support that. I'm, I'm inviting Bishop Sauls, who is the president of Love Must Act, to come and speak to us sometime soon. I think the only thing that's missing from our outreach is more involvement by more people. I think we have a, an incredible core. Um, I think that uh, we need we need to just have an expectation that this is what we do. That if you're a member of St. Thomas, at some point during the week or during the year, you're involved in outreach. And that brings us to the big one. Mission. Mission, purpose. The thing that we heard a lot about over the last few days. What is our purpose? What? Why are we here? Why is it important that we gather to worship? Why is it important that we have good music? Why is it important that we invite people and make them feel welcome? Or that we? Why do we care if children are formed in faith? They do just fine without it. Why is it important that we serve the poor and needy? Isn't that what the government's there for? How would this community, and I don't mean St. Thomas, how would South Miami Pinecrest Carl Gables be different if St. Thomas weren't here? What kind of hole would we leave? What would be missing? What's our purpose? Not the mission statement on the cover of the book, and that's beautiful. That, that talks about who we want to be for one another. I'm talking about our purpose, why we're here, our mission. Mission comes from missio, which means to send. God sends Jesus on a mission, and God sends the Holy Spirit to the church at Pentecost. And then God sends us. God mobilizes us to do difficult tasks. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was sending out his disciples to places that he was going to go, he gave them a clear mission. Go heal the sick and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Maybe not an easy mission, but a simple mission. At the end of his life, just before he ascended, his, his mission to them was, go make disciples of all nations. Again, not exactly easy, but, you know, you could, you could put, it on a, uh, you know, put it on the front of the bullet. That was 2,000 years ago, but we have to listen every year, every morning, what is God calling us to do? Where is God sending us today? We have to put that purpose at the center. So I've asked a whole lot more questions than I've given answers, which is kind of the point. Uh, when someone approached me and said, we want to hear your vision for St. Thomas, that immediately got my back up. Um, all I can do is take the vision of St. Thomas and hopefully try to focus it, hopefully try to make connections, hopefully try to, to encourage and, and, and build up the energy so that we can all be the church and the people that God